Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to the lecture series of AICT Atal sponsored five day faculty development program on photonics for green energy demand, organized by Akur College of Engineering and Technology from 23rd to 27th November 2020. <laughs> तू स्वर की देवी है संगीत तुझसे हर शब्द तेरा है हर गीत तुझसे हम है अकेले हम है अधूरे तेरी शरण में हमें प्यार दे माँ मुनियों ने समझी गुनियों ने जानी वेदों की भाषा पुराणों की बानी हम भी तो समझे हम भी तो जाने विद्या का हमको अधिकार दे माँ तू श्वेत वर्णी कमल पे विराजे हाथों में वीणा मुगुट सर पे साजे अज्ञानता के मिटा दे अंधेरे उजालों का हमको संसार दे माँ हिंसार दे माँ हिंसार दे माँ Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. As we are aware that the global community has been the fight against coronavirus, crores of people around the world are affected and countries all over the world are engaged in a battle to save precious lives. This crisis is unthinkable for mankind. However, losing heart or getting shattered is not the solution. TCT has stood strong in such times of crisis and has been able to have fruitful engagement of faculty, students and staff. This has brought positivity around and kept the spirit of learning alive among all of us. Thakur College of Engineering and Technology takes every possible step to nurture your dreams into reality and ensures uh, with that, success surely has no limits by providing quality technical education in tune with international standards and contemporary global requirements. TCT founded in 2001 with a mission to provide state-of-the-art infrastructure and right academic ambience for developing professional leadership and managerial skills. TCT is affiliated with the University of Mumbai recognized by AICT, DT, and the government of Maharashtra. TCT has also received as A grade by NAC, accredited by NBA, and recently entered the second year of autonomy. TCT emphasizes on the holistic development of every student through curricular, co-curricular, and extracurricular activities. So if we consider this FDP, if we see the global scenario, with the pollution levels reaching alarming levels, Worldwide, there is a quest to search for the environment-friendly alternative energy technologies. After Montreal and Kyoto Protocol, a world is inclined towards renewable energy. Green energy technologies are potential sources of clean energy, and their optimal use may lead to minimizing environmental impacts, produce minimum secondary waste to make them economically viable. Solar energy is green form of energy and it is replacing conventional fuel for different power generation and various applications. Solar energy is more attractive due to its availability in average more than 300 days of year. Major solar applications have relative smaller playback period. This makes it more economical. So the objectives of the program are introduction about current scenario of green energy sources across globe and opportunities, understand photovoltaics in green energy, solar cell fundamentals, materials for solar cells and its application. For this FDP, experts from IITs and some international speakers will not only give theoretical insights about subject from their research work, but also give laboratory practice to start research in the field or set up laboratory in your institute. Now I will share the schedule for this FDP. As you can see, today in the morning, there was common inauguration organized by AICT. 
नाउ वी आर हैविंग की नोट एड्रेस बाय डॉक्टर दीपा खुशलानी ऑन रोल ऑफ ग्रीन एनर्जी इन ग्लोबल सीनारियो पोस्ट लंच टू टू थ्री थर्टी वी विल हैव लैब सेशन यूजिंग लैब व्यू बाय डॉक्टर अर्पित रावणकर फ्रॉम टी आई एफ आर टूमोरो फर्स्ट सेशन टेन टू इलेवन थर्टी विल बी ऑन फोटोनिक्स प्रैक्टिकल्स ऑन गरुडा क्लाउड बाय डॉक्टर लोचन जॉली फ्रॉम टी सी टी इलेवन फोर्टी फाइव टू वन फिफ्टीन वी विल हैव सेशन ऑन पी एन जंक्शन डायोड एंड इंट्रोडक्शन टू सोलर सेल्स बाय प्रोफेसर ब्रिज मोहन अरोरा फ्रॉम आई आई टी बॉम्बे एंड पोस्ट लंच फ्रॉम टू टू थ्री थर्टी वी विल हैव सेशन ऑन डिजाइन ऑफ सिलिकॉन सोलर सेल्स बाय डॉक्टर हेमंत घोष फ्रॉम आई आई टी बॉम्बे ऑन ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ फर्स्ट सेशन विल बी फ्रॉम टेन टू इलेवन थर्टी दैट इज इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ सिम्युलेशन इन फोटो वोल्टाइक्स बाय डॉक्टर सुचिस्मिता मित्रा फ्रॉम आई आई टी बॉम्बे फॉलोड बाय टू लैब सेशंस फ्रॉम बाय डॉक्टर सुचिस्मिता मित्रा फ्रॉम आई आई टी बॉम्बे on 2611 the first session will be on characterization techniques for silicon solar cells by dr ashok sharma uh, from iit bombay then uh, post lunch from 2 to 3 we will have session on stress management by varun upadhyay and 3 to 330 we will have introduction about national initiative to support research in photovoltaics that is about pump program and ncpr lab by dr dinesh kabra from iit bombay from 345 to 515 we will have session on photovoltaic based systems by professor satyabrata jeet from iit bhg on 27th the first session will be on fabrication of industrial crystalline silicon wafer solar cells by dr prabir basu from solar energy research institute of singapore the second session from 1145 to 115 will be on advanced pv module concepts by dr jayprakash singh uh from solar energy research institute of singapore and post lunch 2 to 330 we will have hybrid solar cells uh by dr rajni sharma uh from iit bombay uh without further delay now i request ms megha gupta assistant professor extc to introduce and welcome our keynote speaker dr deepa kushlani over to you megha madam thank you very much sukruti ma'am a uh, very good afternoon to one and all present here it gives me immense pleasure to introduce you all with our speaker for the day professor deepa kushlani madam is professor in materials chemistry department of chemical sciences at tata institute of fundamental research tifr mumbai madam has achieved crsi bronze medal in chemistry in the year 2018 she is also a proud receiver of dst nano mission young career award in nano science and technology in the year 2016 professor deepa kushlani has a long list of achievements few of them can be listed as fellow of royal society of chemistry editorial board member of scientific reports nature publishing group women member of indian academy of sciences in science panel and member of royal society of chemistry uk professor deepa kushlani is a materials chemist and her area of expertise involves synthesis characterization and application of a variety of inorganic structures such as morphology phase and signs and size are carefully manipulated so that there is precise control over homogeneity and compositional purity the ensuing materials are applied in areas exploiting alternate sources of clean energy involving photovoltaics and energy storage devices her group also works on drug delivery devices photocatalysis and electrocatalysis madam is also extensively involved in science outreach she actively promoted basic sciences with rural and economically deprived areas of india given several workshops lectures and mentoring sessions to the endless list i would also like to include that madam was lecturer in inorganic chemistry for university of kent at canterbury uk for 3 years madam was post doctoral researcher in university of bristol uk in the year 1999 she has done her phd in inorganic chemistry with first class from university of toronto canada and 
BSc Chemistry with honors from University of British Columbia, Canada. With these words, I would like to invite Madam to enlighten us with her vast knowledge and help us understand the role of green energy in a global scenario. Requesting Madam to take over the session. Um, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, um, Excellent. So I will just start uh, sharing my slide. One second. You can see my slides, I hope. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. So thank you very much. I'm going to start off the talk with um, acknowledging and gratefully thanking the organizers of this uh, incredible workshop that TCT has organized. And it's a pleasure to be uh, the keynote speaker today to start off this uh, one week long workshop. And um, I hope I can do justice. I'm a chemist. And I, you know, this uh, Google Meet way of meeting people is not always perfectly conducive because I can't see any of you right now. Everyone has their videos off. And uh, so I cannot actually see my audience. And that makes life a little difficult because I do not know if you're able to understand what I'm saying. I'm sort of just looking at my computer screen. But I would really hope that if anybody has any questions during the talk, please feel free to interrupt me. I have no issues. And the idea is that I want um, the audience to walk away from this talk knowing and clearly understanding everything that I want to talk about. It's a very general talk. Uh, I do not aim it for chemists or physicists or biologists, but I hope that all the teachers, all the lecturers, all the university um, academics who are here are able to understand the premise of what I want to talk about in terms of as an introduction to this workshop. I will try and not go too much into details because I think you have fantastic speakers lined up for the rest of the week who will go more into details. I will be happy to discuss any details if you want, but the idea is to give you a general overview. And uh, the title is obviously Role of Green Energy in the Global Scenario, the various ways of looking at it. This is the way that I sort of look at this problem. So energy, when we talk about energy, these are the things that we use energy for. There are obviously a variety of types of energy everyone is familiar with, but, um, and we use this to drive our daily life. And it's, uh, quint it's absolutely the core uh, commodity that decides how fruitful we are in our daily lives how it, from the kind of food we eat, where the food comes from, the irrigation, transporting it from the farmers to our, our towns and cities, us being able to buy those um, materials, those um, items for us to feed ourselves, to the way that we run the rest of our day from the electricity that is used to uh, provide uh, illumination in our rooms, to the computers we use to work effectively, uh, to the transportation that we use every day, be it a bus or a car or a train that we use. And um, it also is obviously part of our entertainment purposes when we watch TV and go see movies. So energy is a core commodity that decides how fruitful, how productive, how active we are in our daily lives and what is the quality of life that we're leading. Um, but to get started about this energy issue, I just want to bring up a few slides about the, you know, what is the driving force of uh, this requirement of energy. This slide, I think everybody's familiar with, we do know that India is the second most populous country in the world. This is just a recent histogram that I was able to come up with, uh, get access to, and you can see we are currently around 1.2, 1.3 billion people in our nation. We are the second most populous country. What is even more important is what's going to happen to the population in our country. We will surpass China in our lifetime. This is the projection that by 2065, which is not that far away, it's only 43, 44 years away, um, 
we will be the most populous country. In fact, we are expected to surpass China in the next 20 years. This is the projected population. And why am I talking about population? Because the reason is it's about energy and it's energy use per capita that I will be talking about. And so as a country on this planet, we, India has a very important and pivotal role to play about the kind of energy we use. Because in terms of consumers of energy, we, if you think about our population being the largest, we in principle should be the largest consumers of energy on the planet. And that has ramifications associated with it. So let's talk a little bit about the quality of life. I had mentioned this briefly on my first slide. What I'm trying to show you with this slide is something called the Human Development Index. You may or may not be familiar with this index, but it's an index that is computed, computed by the United Nations Development Program. It's given there. This data is actually from 2016. And what I'm showing you on the y-axis is the Human Development Index score. Ideally, what you want is the score to be as high as possible. Why do you want the score to be as high as possible? You want it because in this score goes the, um, quality, the education level of the country, which is what is the average level of education, what is the average life expectancy of that country means, how good are the health, medical benefits associated, and how do we do disease prevention, the other aspect that goes into calculating this index is something called the GDP, which is the gross domestic product, which is how rich we are as a country. And I hope you can see, I'm not sure, can you see my mouse? Can somebody help me out here? And just let me know if you can see the mouse. I'm cir circling India currently. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, so, as you can see, India is here. India does not have a very high human development index. The countries that ideally people want to emigrate to as Indians, you know, we love to want to go and travel and live abroad. Here you see all the sort of countries that we want to go and live abroad. And they have a very high uh, human development index because we know the quality of life is good there, the level of education provided for everybody, the entire country, the entire population is high and the medical benefits, the life expectancy is good. What I'm not showing you is the x-axis currently. And this is where it makes a huge difference. Now I'm going to remove this and you will see what is on the x-axis. The x-axis is electricity consumption per capita. And what is written there on top, I'll just read it out as well, is that the higher electricity consumption is directly correlated with higher development in human welfare indicators. Means that if we want India to have the kind of life that we would ideally like to see, for example, what is currently being done in US or Canada or UK, if we want that quality of life, we actually, per capita, per human being in our, in our nation, we will need to start consuming more and more electricity. This is just an interesting and justifiable um, correlation because it's about, think of it, if you want to study, you need electricity at night. Your children, your students cannot study if they do not have 24-hour electricity supply. So once we start providing 24-hour electricity supply to every Indian national, you are going to find that the electricity consumption is increasing per person. And therefore, we are going to be moving on the right side of this axis. It also means that if you want to have food, a higher amount of food for everybody, good quality food, your irrigation system, your transportation system, your farming system need to improve. And that inevitably means that they are going to be taking up more and more energy consumption. The farmers will need a higher uh, sources of cheap electricity to be able to irrigate their farms and to grow the kind of crops that we want them to grow. But this comes, you know, with a price. It's not about that we just use more and more electricity as a nation, and therefore we will have better and better human development index, but it comes at a price when you increase the electricity use. 
and I just written it here, but I'll read it out. What I'm trying to say here, energy used increased from so much to so much from the period of 1990 to 2016. Okay, this is a range from 1990 to 2016. And the energy consumption increased 1.8 times. It's written in red here. By the same token, CO2 that was emitted increased two and a half times. There was a direct correlation with the amount of pollution that was being generated along with the energy consumption. By the way, as a result of this increased energy consumption, our human development index did increase. Our quality of life from 1990 to 2016 did increase from you know, these units. So there is a direct correlation. The quality of life is improving, but CO2, and as you know, CO2 is a pollutant gas, also increased, substantially increased, quite um, in, at a much higher rate than the energy. And why is that? Because where is this electricity coming from? Where is this energy coming from in our nation? It's coming from the fact that we are burning coal. India as a coal user, as a coal consumer, is one of the larger consumers of coal per capita in the world. This little pie chart is showing you in black that almost 75%, this was in 2017-18, um, period, and you will see that our consumption of coal was 75% in terms of uh, our entire electricity was being generated by burning coal. How do we burn coal? We burn them in what are called thermal power plants, where coal is ignited and energy is released because you're breaking up those carbon-carbon bonds, and they drive turbine engines from which electricity is generated. There are obviously other sources of energy, but they are small, substantially small than coal. Coal is our biggest source of electricity. And this coal use is not decreasing with time, I should tell you, despite everything that we know. This is a data, again, it's a report from BP uh, from 2016. You will see that India coal, uh, what this little um, graph is trying to show you, is the coal production, which is in gray, which are basically all the coal mines that we are harvesting coal from. As you know, coal mines come more and more in the in news lately about you know where there's all a whole bunch of corruption going on, but coal mines are only producing so much coal, and that is shown in these gray histograms. What is showing in this black line is the coal consumption. And as you can see, our consuming of coal does not match our coal production. So what are we doing? We are importing coal, believe it or not. As time goes on, India is importing coal. And India needs to import, import coal simply to keep running those thermal plants. And we are, in fact, uh, um, sort of sanctioning new thermal power plants under the current government. As of even two years ago, new power plants based on coal, new thermal power plants were being sanctioned and built so that they can generate electricity so that we can have 24 hour electricity because you want all the villages, all the small towns in this country to have that. And this is where it's coming from. That what you think is uh, India developing, India improving because we have 24 hour electricity, but you have to keep in mind where this electricity is coming from. By the way, coal is not the only source of energy. It's the source of electrical energy. We also use oil, diesel oil. I'm talking about crude oil. And again, oil consumption is shown in gray. And oil, sorry, oil production is shown in these gray histograms. Oil consumption, as you can see, is dramatically increasing. This is at least a recent report from BP from 2019. And therefore, we are importing oil. And this importing is not decreasing with time. It is only going to increase. Keep in mind, forget the COVID lockdown business. Once we are over this COVID, we will go back to the way life was. And um, life just means that we are continuously going to continue using coal and oil to provide our, uh, to be the largest sources of energy in this country. And these is, you know, just a little set of pictures. So what is the payback? What is the drawback of all of this? It's the pollution. We have a great deal of pollution in our country. And where you see this sort of a haze 
pretty much in every city, in every small town, in every village to an extent now in India. And this will only keep getting worse because what is this? This is smog, S-M-O-G, smog. And these are small carbon particles that are released into the air because coal is not completely combusted or the, uh, your crude, your uh, gasoline in your car is not completely combusted. This is a effluent of that incomplete combustion. And just to show you what is the difference it makes, I actually was able to get this picture of India Gate recently of the internet. The stuff on the left side, you see India Gate on a conventional day. In fact, it's a day currently in Delhi. It looks like what looks on the left side. Without smog, it looks what it is on the right side. And in fact, they were able to capture, the photographer mentioned this and when they posted this picture, that this was at the height of the COVID lockdown because we had a lockdown where there were no cars running for an extended period and industries were not um, uh, operable. They were in lockdown mode. So the air was able to sort of show a little bit of clarity. And as you can see, this is a huge difference the stuff on the left side is a conventional image. It has medical issues. People have asthma. People have medical disease, um, you know, difficulties with the stuff on the left side. And obviously, we do not want that. But the problem is, how do we alleviate this? So, uh, just to show you uh, why CO two, in case because uh, it's a, I, I assume these are lecturers and teachers. This is your combustion reaction of hydrocarbons. So this is a standard equation that most people use where you have a hydrocarbon and you have oxygen and this is a complete combustion okay what I'm trying to show you is when you have complete combustion you get CO2 and water and you get this heat heat is what is used to drive your turbine engines and uh, it gives you that mechanical energy to generate electricity but when you have incomplete combustion you have carbon particles or NOx particles or SOx particles and so forth so how do we as scientists, as chemists, address these issues? So the idea is obviously talking about green resources of energy, the title of this workshop. So let me just talk a little bit about what, how much green energy is up there. And what I'm showing you is a table. It's a little old, it's from 2008, but it sort of tells you the entire world energy resources and availability. So this is about oil and gas, conventional, unconventional, shale gas, and so forth. These are all non-renewable resources. And what you're seeing here is about the energy potential that is still lying there on our planet and us being able to harvest it and exploit it. And this is non-renewable means that we can't make more of it. This is what it is. This is the conventional amount of oil that is sitting under Saudi Arabia and Iran and a little bit in India and elsewhere. But this is, in principle, the maximum potential that is available. It does not replenish itself. When it comes to renewable resources, which is sunlight on land and wind is another source of energy, as you can see in terms of the same units, which is terawatt year, per year, you will see that these numbers are very large. And look at the sunlight numbers specifically, it's very large. And we call it renewable because so much energy, what I'm circling here with my mouse, so much energy is coming every year. So it's not getting depleted with time. The, uh, the crux of this energy is that we have to learn how to use it, how to exploit it effectively. And that is not easy. Just to put these numbers with respect to how much we actually use, present value of total world energy consumption is approximately 16 terawatt, okay? And it's expected to double. Obviously, it doesn't stay stagnant with the population increasing, with the kind of society we are evolving to where we, gen where we use and depend much more on electricity because we're having new devices and new cars and so forth that depend on electricity. So this use with this number 16 number will only increase with time. And if you think about it, this was the main sentence that everybody is blown over by. And it's the reason why people are pursuing solar energy. It says that an hour of solar radiation on Earth provides so much terawatt of energy, almost the same as the world's total energy, annual energy consumption. An hour of solar radiation means if we are able to harvest 
and convert sun's energy just for one hour very effectively, we could be meeting the requirement of our planet. And the best part is because it's sun's energy, it does not create pollution and therefore we will also not have this issue with um, the drawbacks. So let's just talk a little bit about these renewable resources. I am not going to spend too much on wind. Suffice it to say, what do we mean by wind energy? We mean by using these sort of windmills that are again based on the turbine engine. When wind blows, these paddles rotate. When these paddles rotate, they generate mechanical energy, which can be converted into electricity. And we have these sort of uh, windmill farms, as it were, in many places. This is an image from Tamil Nadu, but obviously they have to be located where you have a large amount of wind available to you, ideally for the most part of the day, so that the windmills are turning automatically. Um, this is not as prevalent in India because we do not have as much of the high wind needed to generate a sufficient amount of electricity. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is just by having the windmills is not sufficient. What you need to do is also store that energy, keep that in mind. And this is also for later on, for the rest of the week, I want you to keep in mind. It's not um, uh, the windmill, as it were, these wind turbines generate electricity, but they do not store electricity. When they generate electricity is only when the wind is blowing. And ideally, you may not want electricity at that time. You as a consumer, as the population, as the city may not want to use electricity at that time when the wind is blowing. So what we have to do is we have to store that energy. And this energy gets stored in devices similar to what are called batteries and capacitors. And therefore, you need a large infrastructure, keep in mind, where you store that energy that is coupled with your wind farm. And just to, you know, this little uh, diagram sort of shows you the kind of energy storage you need. A couple of, and it's the same thing when we talk about the other kind of renewable energy, which I think most of you are here to talk and learn about or listen about, and these are solar cells. So this image you're seeing here is obviously our current prime minister, but in the background and the main thing that I want you to pay attention to are what are called silicon solar cells. And another word for solar cells is photovoltaics. And uh, this is a main source of energy or should be, I should say, it should be the primary source of energy in our country, simply because we are a tropical country and we have an inordinate amount of sunlight. We get a large amount of sunlight for the most part of the day, and therefore we are positioned geographically in a very ideal way to be able to harvest this energy effectively. And what is this energy I'm talking about? What is a photovoltaic? A photovoltaic is nothing but, or a solar cell is nothing but converting sun's energy into electricity. It has a premise or the scientific principles are based on something called a photoelectric effect. And uh, just to show you, um, this is used extensively. This is an image of a satellite, for example. And I'm sure you've seen a satellite uh, uh, many times over, uh, at least on TV and so forth. But I want you to pay attention to what are these large panels. I'm not sure if many of you paid attention. You know, the actual satellite where all the telecommunications and all the experiments and all the science goes on is actually a very small capsule. It's not a very big capsule. Most of the satellites are not manned, it means there are no human beings inside it. So that electronic component is actually very small. What makes up a large part of the satellite is because all these telecommunications need electricity to run on and the electricity is provided by these solar panels. And I want you to see the solar panels, they're huge. First of all, they're solid, they're not bendable as it were, you, know, you understand? And they're inorganic and they're multi-layers and you learn how these solar panels are made. But the physical size of the, the physical dimensions of these solar panels are huge because you need those solar panels are what are converting sun's energy because they are always positioned pointing towards the sun to generate the electricity to drive all the um, devices that are inside the satellite. So let's talk about sun's energy. What is sun's energy and how are we using it for electricity? Why is it so uh, um, such a viable way of doing things? 
What I want you to pay attention to is the gray curve here. I hope you can see the gray, curve, the gray sort of um, darkened area of my slide. That is the entire solar spectrum that is landing on our planet, at least at sea level. Okay, and y-axis is about radiation, irradiance, sorry. It's about flux, it's about intensity, how many photons. And on the x-axis are all the wavelengths. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that visible light, which usually is from about 350 to 800, 750 or so, is positioned at where you have the maximum intensity, maximum flux. You have other types of photons also arriving on our planet from the sun. You have a UV region, you have a IR region and a deep IR, fire, far IR and so forth. But because their flux, their intensities are not very high, we intend or we tend to use only the visible spectrum of this part of the solar radiation or we want to exploit because what we want to do is capture this energy. If we can capture this sort of energy also, it would be lovely. But the other thing I want you to keep in mind is that the wavelength is inversely proportional to energy. Lambda is inversely in terms of the uh, uh, what is the most uh, high uh, state. So the smaller the wavelength, the stronger is the electron that you're getting out of the EV of the electron, the power of the electron, if you're able to eject an electron, UV using UV illumination is going to be much stronger than if you're using the far IR. So that is also about the potential of that electron that you're generating. That is why a lot of people are mostly working on the left side of this x-axis where you want to exploit and harvest and capture and convert these photons that are in this area of the wavelength, okay? Now, this slide you will see many times over, I think, in today's work, uh, in this week's workshop. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Suffice it to say what you're going to see is something called a solar cell efficiency. Solar cells have been around for a very long time. In fact, they were first invented mostly for NASA purposes because NASA wanted to send all these rockets and satellites into space and they needed a long-term supply of energy for their satellites so it was evolved and developed there but it started well in the 1950s or earlier in fact um, and so over time x, uh, the x-axis in this graph is showing you time over time a variety of different kind of solar cells have evolved it's not just one kind and, but the main principle of any of these colored lines that you see here, the main principle still remains the same, which is sun hits your solar cell. The composition of the solar cell changes, depends on which line, colored line you're looking at. But what we're doing is converting those photons and converting them into excited electrons. Okay, electrons that are in the excited state or that have captured that energy associated with a 300 nanometer photon or a 400 nanometer photon that is hitting. And what we want to do is we want to capture this photon, capture the energy of the photon in an excited electron or an electron that is in an excited state and basically ensure we trap it that the electron does not come back down to the ground state. We don't want to lose that energy. We only want to lose it when that electron does work. It wants to light a bulb or we want to store that excited electron. It should not basically lose that energy. And that is what a solar cell does. Solar cell does not store the energy. It only captures it and converts it into a set of uh, electric charge carriers, viable electric charge carriers, which are these electrons. By the way, there's also a hole, an excited hole that you can capture. So I don't want to spend too much on this photovoltaic, but I hope I was able to hand wave my way through this so that you can appreciate what um, this um, graph is showing you. On the y-axis is showing you efficiency. And what I want you to see is how the efficiency has been increasing over time and therefore, um, I will, oh, I have a pen here, fantastic. So what I want to show you, um, sorry, I seem to have lost my mouse here. 
right? So what I want to show you is, as you can see, there are certain things that are just moving very horizontally over time. They have not increased in efficiency too fast. I hope you can see my red lines. But by the same token, I want you to see this little graph here. Okay, I hope you can see this graph here that I'm sort of drawing. I will just undo if I can or delete. Um, eraser. Right? So I will now do it again. Just to, this is, please bear with me. So as you can see here, you see this line. As you can see, this line has been increasing very fast, the slope of this line, compared to all the other lines that you see there. These are all first generation, second generation, third generation kind of solar cells. The ones that a lot of people talk about are these crystalline solar cells. They're in blue. You see the blue lines, the efficiency has not been increasing very fast. What is of interest to a lot of people are these, uh, where is my mouse going? <laughs> I can't seem to, I think it just, uh, so I want, oh, sorry. I want you to see that, oh, I apologize. I'm not, um, let me just get my eraser. So you see this. This part here, right? These are the third generation, what are called emerging photovoltaics. And these are the ones that are highlighted here, for example, and here. And these are the ones that people are interested in because these are new technologies that have started over the last 10 years, 20 years or so, and they're showing a great deal of promise. The reason people are interested with this is because they are cheap. All of these other types that you see here with the multi-junction solar cell, this stuff here, this stuff here, these are the blue ones are commercially available. The purple ones are lovely because they have fantastic efficiency, but these are very expensive, these purple ones. And then this is the one that I want you to pay attention to that is showing uh, the most interest and that I think a lot of the speakers will be talking about for the rest of the week. But this is all I want to talk about solar cells because this is one way of converting sun's energy into viable electricity. I want to not talk, um, how am I doing with time? Can I ask the organizers how much time I have left? Uh, yes, ma'am, you have half an hour more. Okay, excellent. So I want to now talk a little bit about a slightly different way of using sunlight. And now I want to talk about another kind of renewable energy, and that is hydrogen gas. The reason I want to talk about hydrogen gas is mainly from a transportation point of view. If you think about it, as solar cells are fantastic. They generate electricity. But one of the main sources or uses of energy as a consumer is for transportation. We drive cars, we drive buses, we have trains, we have airplanes, and these form of transportation are part and parcel of our life. We can't get away from it. And does it mean that we turn all of these forms of transportation into electric vehicles, or is there a way, another way around it? And this is where I wanted to talk, I want you to discuss a kind of a different fuel as opposed to diesel or as opposed to gasoline. I want to talk about hydrogen gas as a fuel. Why do I want to talk about hydrogen gas? So this is not hydrogen atom. This is H2 molecule. Why do I want to talk about it? So let's just talk about uh, in terms of the energy potential. Here you see a table and you see a variety of chemicals that are used to supply energy to us. We call it energy storage material. Okay, I will, I will. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Apologies, I'm not very good with my mouse, but you understand that what I'm trying to highlight is this storage material. And you see a variety of storage materials like diesel and jet fuel, all of you are familiar. And what I want you to see on the right side is their specific energy, which is megajoules per kilogram. That is what I'm trying to highlight. So this is the potential, and this is why we use diesel in our cars. Diesel gives us more energy as opposed to gasoline, but diesel causes a lot more issues with pollution as well. Coal does not have as much energy per kilogram. Okay, this is per kilogram. And obviously batteries and so forth have a different amount of energy associated with it. Now, I remember I mentioned hydrogen gas. 
So this little table shows you the same value uh, in the same units of the potential of the energy associated in this inside this hydrogen molecule. What is happening? The idea is just like we burn gasoline, gasoline being a carbon-based material, and I'd shown you the oxidation reaction. We burn gasoline. Problem is we get CO2 and water, and we get that heat, and we get that energy that we exploit. We can do the same thing with the hydrogen molecule. We can combust hydrogen molecule. So here's this equation that you should have realized by now. When we combust hydrogen molecule, what we are getting is we're getting water only. And the best part is when we are combusting this molecule, the amount of heat that I would get here is substantially larger than the kind of heat that I would get here. Okay. So I hope you can appreciate this fact that um, not only is hydrogen molecule a clean form of fuel because we don't get any pollution when we combust it, but it gives us a substantially large amount of energy. And what I'm trying to show you here is, so there are vehicles, you might have seen them. So here you see a bus and it's titled Zero Emission Hydrogen Fuel Cell Bus. So what does that mean? It means that it doesn't run on gasoline or diesel, it runs on hydrogen gas and they are combusting hydrogen gas to give them the supply of um, energy, mechanical energy to drive the bus. And the best part is this bus only releases water as a byproduct and that is why they call it zero emission. And this is also happening in India. So this is from an article in India Today from 2018. And you see here, Tata is the one that is responsible. And they're making these buses that only emits water and you can drive. And you know, many cities and towns and municipal corporations are trying to buy these buses for their public transportation. So you might say, well, oh, the problem is solved. We have this lovely fuel weekend. We should actually make all our cars and all our devices and all our vehicles out of this hydrogen gas. And why are we not doing that? Well, the reason we're not doing it is simply because we do not have enough supply of hydrogen gas available to us on the planet. There is no lake under Saudi Arabia, as it were, that is able to provide us this hydrogen gas. We actually have to make hydrogen gas. And so just like the top reaction here that I was showing you that in order to, when we combust hydrogen gas, we make water, I can do the reverse reaction as well. No, if I want to make hydrogen gas, what if I split water? I can split water to give us hydrogen gas and water because to make hydrogen, I don't want to cause pollution. So I want to find a green way of making this fuel of the future. So just like that releases energy, this one needs energy. So the top is an exothermic reaction, the bottom is an endothermic reaction. It needs energy. So how do we do this reaction? Water by itself cannot spontaneously cleave and give us hydrogen gas and oxygen. So this is the reaction we want to do. We want to take water and we want to make hydrogen and oxygen. So the question is, what type of reaction is this? Is it easy to carry out? Is it trivial? And does it happen in one step? So the first thing I want you to realize, I, I'm not sure if all the teachers have picked up on this, this reaction, this water splitting reaction is called a redox reaction. There's a reduction and an oxidation happening simultaneously. And therefore, if you have a redox reaction, you can actually do an electrochemical reaction to do this water splitting. What do I mean by electrochemical reaction? So what we have is a beaker. We put two electrodes in it. You can put two graphite electrodes inside a beaker of water. You apply a power source, means a battery. You can use any battery, a five volt battery, as it were, or a nine volt battery. And when you apply energy to these two electrodes, you can drive this reaction. So what you're going to get is oxygen coming out as your oxidation product and hydrogen coming out as your reduction product. So this is an interesting way of making hydrogen gas. So, and you can trap these bubbles that are coming up, correct? You can just, it's not that complicated. So you'll say, well, we have lots of water available to us. We have seawater, we have lots of oceans and so forth that we could be using 
and doing this water splitting reaction and be making hydrogen gas. When we make hydrogen gas, we can use it as our fuel. And this is a relatively green way of doing it. Agreed. But the problem is where is this power coming from to drive this reaction? At the end of the day, this is electricity. We cannot be burning coal <laughs> to drive this reaction because that is causing problems as well. So let's just look at this reaction in a little bit more detail. So this is where now I'm going a bit more deeper into the science and I hope everybody stays with me and I don't lose any of the audience. Let's break up the water splitting reaction a little bit into the two steps, the reduction and the oxidation. And that's what I'm showing you here. What I'm showing, what I'm showing you here is that um, this is a, a, um, a water oxidation on top and a water reduction at the bottom. Water oxidation is a four electron process. It releases four electrons for every one mole of O2 that we generate. And we take these four electrons here and we can drive the reduction reaction. I get two moles of H2. Okay, and hence this is my balanced equation. It happens at a redox potential. These are the potentials at which these two reactions take place. Means therefore, what am I trying to say with this? It means therefore that I want to, uh, uh, the battery, this battery here needs to provide 1.23 volts minimum. But you'll say 1.23 volts is not large. And I was actually telling you five volt and nine volt battery in the back when I was telling you how to drive the electrochemical reaction. This is an ideal value. This is not what reality gives us. Reality gives us a much larger potential we need to provide. 1.23 volts by no means is what is done because this is a theoretical value. Experimentally, you need to provide a lot more energy. And because experimentally, we need to provide more energy, this way of doing chemistry is not very useful. We actually burn a lot of coal and we have to use a lot more electricity than the amount of hydrogen we are able to generate. And so people want to get and find other ways of doing this. By the way, I, just because we're going a little deep, I want you to appreciate this reaction, the way it's written, is not a one-step reaction. By the same token, this is not a one-step reaction. The water reduction, what is written here, is actually a multiple step reaction. And by the same token, I'll just go quickly, the water oxidation step, remember it's a four electron oxidation step, each electron happens separately. There's a different activation barrier. All these steps are happening on that electrode in which my electrochemical cell has. And therefore, as you can imagine, the nature of the electrode plays a huge role because not all electrodes, platinum electrode, carbon electrode, other metallic electrodes, not all electrodes drive all of these four reactions. Let's say this is the oxidation step I'm looking at. They will not all drive the oxidation steps in the same at the same rate. The activation barriers will be different. So what people do is, so now this is a new schematic I'm trying to show you. And what I want to show you is, therefore, the two electrodes are made up of different materials in my electrochemical cell. This is the electrode that drives the reduction. This is the electrode that drives the oxidation. And as you can see, physically, there are different materials that actually people use because we want to optimize the oxidation and reduction. And if you're going to, so the nature of the electro plays a huge role driving the actual experimental potential that we want to draw for you. Remember the theoretical potential is 1.23 volt. Reality does not give us 1.23 volt. Depending on my electrodes, I could be using five electrodes, 10, five volts, nine volts, or sometimes even larger. And we don't want to use so much additional energy. We want to bring it as close to the theoretical value as possible. So people do research, and this is from a recent re uh, review article, where as you can see, the kind of electrode people, people have looked at, these are all electrode materials, what they're calling as a catalyst, okay? These are all the various compositions that people have used. And what I want you to see is these numbers here, efficiency and so forth. And what is written in millivolt means this is the over potential. How much over the 1.23 volt do you need to provide to drive your reaction? You to drive. So as you want these numbers to be as small as possible. 
and you want efficiencies to be large and so forth. So people do a lot of search in terms of making electrocatalyst as efficient as possible. But does that mean that is the only way of making hydrogen gas that we electrochemically split water? Can we not find other sources of energy to split water? Remember that battery is just providing 1.23 volt of power, theoretical, or a little bit more in principle to drive. Can we not find another source of energy to split water? And so this is where we can use sunlight to split water. And this is inspiration from photosynthesis. And this is where the word photocatalysis, some of you might be familiar with this word, comes from. So it's similar to photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, everybody's completely familiar with what photosynthesis is. Photosynthesis is this reaction that you, you know, 10 standard students are taught and even younger which is you're taking carbon dioxide and water and you're converting into glucose and oxygen. I want you to keep it. So now I want to, you to look at this reaction in a slightly different way, which is imagine if there's no sunlight, obviously this reaction will not proceed. Why will this reaction not proceed? Because it needs energy. Just like water splitting needs energy, carbon dioxide and water co uh, to come together to form glucose needs energy. So this energy is used by the chloroplast and it comes from sunlight. They, it's not, a, we can dry this reaction. By the way, this reaction that I've written here can be driven electrochemically. I can just like that beaker of water to split water. I can also use a beaker of water to put two electrodes in it and I can dry this reaction and in principle form glucose but I will need a very strong battery to do that. The amount of energy needed, I will need quite a bit. But we don't want to make glucose. Like I said, in reality, we want to make hydrogen gas. That is a reaction we as human beings want to explore because nature is already doing photosynthesis for us. So what people do is they take inspiration. And I'm going to show you in one slide, Photosynthesis is a very complicated process. Some of you might be biologists in the audience or would have taught some biology and would be familiar with this. I don't want to go into detail, but as you can see, it's a multiple step process where electrons and protons are transferred over a variety of proteins. And it is what gives us sugar. That reaction, the sugar that forms, the glucose that forms does not form in one step. Sunlight plays a huge role, as you can see. It plays an absolutely pivotal role to drive this uphill reaction because that is this reaction. Sunlight does a bit of water splitting here. I want you to see this part here. Only because the water is splitting do the protons get released. And these protons then get shuttled into forming sugar through this system. So people have spent a lot of time trying to understand it. But I want to break it down to something very simple that is taught in colleges and high schools and so forth. And this is about activation barrier. So this is a normal reaction, an endothermic reaction, where you go from your reagents to your product. And what are my reagents in my product? They are listed here. And this is my activation barrier. So what we do is we want to change. And this remains the same. But what we want to do is we want to change the activation energy because this is a non-spontaneous process. Water splitting is not spontaneous. And how do we do that? We use a catalyst. So catalyst, as you know, reduces that energy. Now, what kind of a catalyst? How does it reduce? We want the catalyst to drive this reaction because we need it to be activated under sunlight. Okay. And what sort of catalyst I'm talking about here? I'm talking about photocatalyst. So by photocatalyst, I mean semiconductors. Why are we talking about semiconductors? We can talk about lots of things. Then this is the inspiration from photosynthesis. I will bring in a little bit, I'll tie it up. Photosynthesis, the crux of the photosynthesis happens inside the leaves of a plant. The leaves of a plant are green and that plays a pivotal role. It is a colored material, chlorophyll, inside the chloroplast. What does that mean? That the chlorophyll is colored 
because it absorbs visible light, it does not absorb green, and green gets scattered back, reflected back to our eyes. But the rest of the visible spectrum, the blues and the reds and so forth, are absorbed, and the energy is absorbed. So if you want to use sunlight, especially the visible spectrum, part of the spectrum of uh, solar radiation, you have to work with colored compounds. Ideally, you should work with black compounds because black is absorbing the entire visible spectrum. And that is the first step needed for the photoelectric effect, first step needed for a photocatalyst because the energy has to be absorbed. The energy levels associated with your material, be it a molecule or a semiconductor, the homolumo gap or the valence band conduction band gap must be conducive to absorbing visible light. The other thing that must be conducive is the electrochemical potential of the conduction band and valence band. So what I'm trying to show you here is basically two red lines. I hope you can see this. Here's one red line and here's another red line at the bottom. These two red lines are basically the redox potential. This top line is the redox potential for driving my oxidation reaction. This is the bottom line is there for my uh, um, sorry, the top line is for my reduction reaction, the bottom line is for my oxidation reaction. So what does it mean? Only those semiconductors and these, semi for example, tungsten oxide ideally, ideally will not work, but cadmium selenide is a very nice one because the position of the bottom of the conduction band and top of the uh, bottom of the valence band and top of the conduction band are conducive to allowing water splitting. And I'll just explain that in a little cartoon. And, and I'll just show it here. So the idea is that this is your semiconductor. When sunlight hits on your semiconductor, your electrons are going into an excited state. And ideally, they should diffuse to the surface. So this is an excited electron. By the same token, I have an excited hole. OK? Why do I have this hole in it? Remember, these are my charge carriers. They're not recombining. And what am I doing with my excited electron? I'm driving my reduction reaction. What am I doing with my excited hole? I'm driving my oxidation reaction. So what is this cartoon trying to show you? You have a material, a semiconductor. If it has the right uh, um, sort of uh, electronic properties and absorbing properties and electron mobility properties and removal of uh, or, or minimizing recombination, minimizing diffusion, minim uh, or maximizing diffusion to the surface, minimizing um, the exciton binding energy and so forth. What you want, uh, so what happens is these charge carriers are able to migrate to the surface and participate in redox chemistry. So what is the experiment? We take a photocatalyst and we put it in a beaker of water. That's it. Because at the end of the day, I need my reagents, right? I need protons and these hydroxide ions, which are happening because water is dissociated anyway at neutral pH. And so the idea is that can we take a, the right kind of semiconductor suspended in water shine light on it, induce these energy carriers, these high activated energy carriers, and help them and allow them to participate in my redox chemistry. Can this be possible? And therefore, what should you see? You should see hydrogen gas bubbling, and you should see oxygen gas bubbling out of your beaker of water, simply by shining light. And this has been done, and this is what I want to show you. I hope all of you can see this video. So what you're seeing here is basically a simple material, a very interesting material that is suspended in a beaker of water. And only when you're shining light are you able to see these bubbles coming out. And what are these bubbles? These bubbles are your uh, hydrogen gas and your oxygen gas coming out from your two electrodes. And this is basically the holy grail. What we want is obviously we want more oxygen and hydrogen coming out at a much faster rate. And these inorganic materials can be recyclable, reusable. And what you are doing 
doing is producing the future in a very green way. There's no pollution happening while we're generating this hydrogen gas. And the best part is we can track this hydrogen gas and finally use it to supply the need of the world for transportation purposes, in principle transportation purposes. Okay, so I'm not sure how much, I think I finished a little early perhaps, but I, I hope we can use the time to answer questions. No one interrupted me, so this sort of, again, the same thing that I'm showing you with respect to the top and bottom of the conduction band valence bands that tell you which semiconductors in principle can be used. This is not the only parameter that drive. This is not the only parameter that is used to decide what makes this video worthwhile, okay? <laughs> there are more to it than that. I've tried to simplify it as, as much as possible so people can appreciate the crux of how we can use visible light to drive and meet the energy requirements of our planet. And I will end it here. Um, I've not talked about any of the research. I just talked about a generic overview, but we are pursuing various aspects in my lab. We work with capture, so energy capture, which is things like solar cells, but we also work with energy storage. And if you think about it, this is energy conversion, what I've discussed, which is we're converting sunlight's energy and holding it into a hydrogen molecule. Hydrogen molecule is basically capturing and it has formed by uh, converting sun's energy into this form of chemical energy because it's a molecule and it's a type of chemical that we can subsequently combust. And I will end here and I want to acknowledge my lab and funding and I work at TIFR and I want to thank everybody for their attention. Um, so please, I hope you were able to understand what I wanted to sort of, uh, uh, you know, the information that I wanted to transfer. And I will be very happy to answer any questions you might have, or you can contact me later. Through this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, madam. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lochan, ma'am. Uh, I think, uh, ma'am, we can take up some questions. So, I would like Lochan, ma'am, to please ask a question. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you for the informative session. Uh, actually, for my research, I was doing this photovoltaic uh, um, properties for a gallium arsenide and then later extended my work to indium gallium arsenide, stating that it's a better option. But, but um, in your slides, that indium gallium arsenide, it's, I, I could not see that. So I just want to know whether the direction in which we were doing our finding out the results of the effect of sunlight on these materials, uh, how does it actually even design a better solar cell with a better efficiency? Okay. So you what? Um, I'll just show you the slide. One second. Uh, you perhaps missed it because it's. Um, can you see my slide? This is the slide you're referring to, right? Can you see this? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Right? So the indium gallium arsenide that you're talking about, are, you know, they, usually there is copper associated with that. And this is where it Okay, so it's copper, indium, gallium, selenite, SIGS technology. This is a thin film technology. Okay, are you with me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I was muted. Right, so these yeah. are the green curve that you are. Okay, huh. so those are the ones that are relevant for your work. Hmm. And uh, this is a um, sort of thin film technology in terms of you know multi-junction solar cells that people use as part of and so these materials are the, so, uh, the light absorbers the crux is always the chemical composition of which material gives you the best ability to convert the absorption of light and convert it into viable extractable electrons correct yes so I think there's no reason for you to stop doing your research. Uh, there's lots of people still working. As, as you can see, that little curve is increasing with time, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
so there's no reason why you need to stop with this work. It is very efficient and relatively speaking, these are not that expensive a material compared to the stuff that is in the <laughs> purple region. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, beyond that, I don't know what you want me to say. Uh, the, it's a question of how you make the film, how you make the contacts, what are your electron transport and whole transport layers, how are you fabricating the devices? There are lots of issues because there's iron micro, there's um, sort of uh, doping levels and heterogeneity in the material. So all of this is about manufacturing and engineering your device properly to improve the efficiency and finding cheaper and cheaper ways of doing that. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we will have one more question from Mr. Anand. Uh, that can you suggest any specific material used for nanosynthesis? <laughs> any specific material for use in nanosynthesis of what? I mean, what is your? Sorry, it's a very vague question. So. Uh, depends on your application that you have in mind. Um, you see, the word nanosynthesis people use a lot. Keep in mind, yeah. anyway, can I ask the person who's asking the question to elaborate? What is it that you want to do? What? Anand sir, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, I see it now. Um, can you suggest any specific material used for nanosynthesis? Any reagent can be, you know, it depends if you're making inorganic, organic material, uh, polymeric materials, all of them. So, for photo catalytic uh, conversion, he has added to this question. For photocatalysis. Yes. Right. So for photocatalysis, uh, people usually like working with inorganic material simply because they're a bit more stable. So you're looking at tungsten oxide, iron oxide, titanium oxide. Oxides are useful because you can work in an aqueous environment. Um, and they're stable as opposed to working with sulfides or selenides or phosphates. So people like working with oxygen so you can work under ambient conditions. And um, these all have a certain absorption capability in the visible region, especially if you dope them, dope them properly. So those would be my recommendations. And there's lots of literature available that you can go through to help you make photocatalyst out of these materials. But one material cannot catalyze every reaction that you are thinking of. Because there are lots of other aspects that come into play. It's about absorption. You know, it does not discuss. For example, if you're doing water splitting, the H plus finally needs to come and absorb on the surface of the catalyst. And different materials have different ways of binding these reagents. So, what might be a good water splitting catalyst may not be a good dehydrogenating catalyst. You know, if you want to dehydrate, I think for example. Um, and so, it depends on what you're looking at. You can um, find ways of making it. Yeah, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we have one more question from Dr. R. Praveena. Can nano garnets be used for water splitting applications? Nano garnets. Now, if I understand garnets, they are a type of silicate materials, if I remember correctly. So, and they have an interesting um, optical properties. Uh, they but uh, the the thing is what you want to do is uh, with materials you do not want them to uh, 
you want them to have a high absorption coefficient. They should not undergo refraction of light. In the sense, crystals are not good. Okay. So what you want are materials that have a very high absorption coefficient for that visible region that you're looking at. You want them to have what are called low excitant binding energy because an excitant is basically your electron and your hole and they have a Coulombic interaction. You want them to have a very weak Coulombic interaction because you want the electron and hole to migrate in different directions. You don't want them to recombine, recouple. So you want them to have a very low excitant binding energy. What you also want are what are called high diffusion rates. You want the excited state to move to the surface. So the properties that need to be present in a material for it to be a good photocatalyst. I I personally not familiar too much with garnet, but you know I suppose like I said, as long as you meet the requirements that I mentioned. Uh, thank you very much again, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, one more question from Mr. Ratan Das. How to store hydrogen in general? Because it's quite a difficult task. Right. So hydrogen gas storage is actually a large area of research. I did not touch upon that. Uh, what people use are porous materials. So think of it like a sponge. Just like water can be held inside a sponge because of capillary forces in the case of hydrogen gas because it's a gas you can use what are called microporous materials or what are called MOFs, metal organic framework and the nice thing is that if you have these MOFs on these porous materials so the, where the pores are very very small then hydrogen gas will go inside and get trapped let's say, low temperatures. And when you elevate the temperature, the porous structure releases the hydrogen gas because the pressure builds up and absolutely elevates the temperature. So that's an interesting and easy way of storing hydrogen gas. There are rules, rules as in uh, there are benchmarks, for example, that the companies and the organization have created that uh, energy storage material must have a certain level of so many moles of hydrogen per kilogram of the material must be able to be stored. So people are looking at the absorption. What I had described so far is physical absorption, physical absorption of hydrogen gas. But you can also have chemical absorption of hydrogen gas, where you have things like nitrogen, for example. Just like hydrogen is stored in nitrogen in the form of ammonia, okay, or borane, and things like that. That chemically trap hydrogen. So if you can put these functionalities into the material, that can be right to hydrogen storage. I hope that was clear. Um, uh, thank you again, ma'am. And Dr. R. Pramina also is thanking you for the answer or pro proper explanation that you have given to him. One more question from Mr. Jayesh. Uh, ma'am, can you advise area which we can go for research? <laughs> can you advise an area? Uh, that's a very general question. My advice to anybody is only pursue research because you like it and find an area that you're passionate about, find some problem that you want to try and address. You may not be able to solve the problem, but at least you'll be working on something that you are interested in. Research is not done for monetary reasons. I'm sure most people have realized this now. Um, so uh, my request is, you know, there's lots of areas of research. People do medical therapy, or, you know, Nobel Prizes are being given out for CRISPR, for instrument development, for being able to image things on a small lens scale. I mean, you know, <laughs> research is a huge <laughs> um, discipline of work, you know, and it's not about whether you're a biologist or a physicist or a computer scientist. You can use all your expertise into one problem, but my request would be to everybody, guys, life is too short, follow your passion, and in even research, find a problem that you feel is something that you, 
you have some affinity to or that you feel that you want to solve and then try and read up on it and understand it and and there are lots of resource people in IITs, ISC Bangalore, ISERs around the country who work on many, many problems who will be able to advise you as to how to make a dent. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am.